Evan. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 20th chapter of Second Chronicles. Here we pick up the history of the nation of Judah at the time that Jehoshaphat is the king. In the previous chapters we read how that he had gone to the northern kingdom to visit Ahab who was one of the wickedest of all of the kings over the nations of Israel. And how while he was with Ahab, Ahab invited him to go up to uh, Ramoth Gilead that he might uh, watch the battle against the Syrians. And while he was there, Ahab said, Hey, you put on my robe, sit in my chariot. I want to get into the fight. And so as Jehoshaphat was sitting in the chariot of Ahab wearing his robe, unbeknownst to him, the Syrian captain said, Hey, we don't care about these men. Let's get their king. And so they saw the king's chariot and they saw Jehoshaphat there in the king's robe and so they began to pursue and Jehoshaphat headed out crying out for help and all and then these fellows realized that they had made a mistake. They saw it wasn't Ahab so they turned from him. And after this frightening experience he returned back to Jerusalem. And after coming back to Jerusalem, the Lord sent a prophet to rebuke him for seeking to create a friendship and an affinity with a man who was an enemy of God. And then as we get into chapter 20, word comes to them that their land is being invaded by a confederacy of nations. For Ammon and Moab have joined together with the Edomites, those from Mount Seir. They have crossed the Dead Sea. They are presently in the area of En Gedi and they are moving up that valley above En Gedi and planning to invade the land of Judah. And hearing that these three nations have come together with their armies and realizing that he does not have an army that is sufficient to match the attack, he called together the people of Judah to come and stand before God there at the temple in Jerusalem. And so the men from Judah gathered together around their king realizing that they were in very desperate straits, realizing that they were being threatened with an invasion that they did not have the capacity to repel. And so the people had gathered together in great fear. He proclaimed a fast among the people, exhorted them to seek the Lord, And then Jehoshaphat called upon God. And in Jehoshaphat's prayer unto the Lord, we find that there was first of all an acknowledgement of God and the greatness of God. You're the God of our fathers. You're the God who rules in heaven. You're the God that oversees and rules over the earth. You're the God of all power. You're the God of Abraham. And you promised unto Abraham that you would give to him this land and to his descendants forever. And your descendants built this place, this sanctuary, this temple as a place where they might come and stand before you and meet you. Now, God, we're standing here today. And Lord, if you'll remember that when this place was dedicated, Solomon prayed, and if their enemies rise up against them, or there be a pestilence or a famine within the land, and they cry unto you from this place, 
then hear thou from thy throne in heaven and help them. And he said, here we are, Lord. Just like Solomon could foresee, we're in trouble. We're faced by an enemy that is stronger than us. And God, we've gathered to this place that we might call unto thee. For he remembered, no doubt, the promise of God to King Solomon when the place was dedicated, declaring, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So here now, or several years later, remembering God's promise to Solomon as he prayed for circumstances that were similar to what they were now facing, Jehoshaphat is crying unto the Lord. Actually, it's a cry for help. God, the Ammonites, Moabites, the Edomites are too much for us. They're too strong for us, God. We don't have the capacity to go out against them. He said, we have no might. We don't have enough strength. And he said, we don't know what to do. Have you ever been in that kind of a predicament where you knew that your resources weren't sufficient for the situation that you were facing and you just didn't know what to do? When you look at your bills and you look at your bank account, you just don't know what to do? You can add up the total of your bills and you know what you've got in your account. What do you do? In the same sense, he was measuring the size of the enemy in his own strength. He knew that he was not able, humanly speaking, to send his army out against this invading force. They were greater, more powerful than he was. God, I don't know what to do. And we so often are faced with a dilemma in which we don't know the answer. It's wise to do what he did, to pray. God help us. We're frightened. This thing is too big for us. Lord, we don't have the might. We don't have the army. We can't, we can't resist these forces, God. We don't know what to do. And so he called upon God. Now, God spoke to them through a prophet that was there. The son of Hanani gave a prophecy. And the Lord, in answering the prayer of the king, first of all said, Don't be afraid or dismayed by your enemy. Get your eyes off of the enemy. Get your eyes off of the problem. Get your eyes on me. The more I look at the problem, the bigger it seems to grow until it absolutely overwhelms me. I get to where I can't really sleep soundly anymore. I wake up in the night and I'm thinking about it. I sit down to eat and my stomach is churning because I can't get it off of my mind. And God is saying, hey, don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed because of your problem. Start looking to me. Start looking at my strength. Start looking at my greatness. Start looking at my power. 
For the Lord said, the battle is not yours, but God's. Now, it is beautiful when you have such a relationship with God that God is willing to identify with you as your father. And as your father, to take up your cause, to defend you, and to stand up for you, so that your battles become his battles, so that your problems become his problems. It's so beautiful to realize that God desires to work in conjunction with you, willing to fight your battles, willing to stand up for you and to defend you. God said, don't be afraid or dismayed of this enemy. The battle is not yours, but it is God's. Now God said, just come on down. Bring the army down to the cliffs at Ziz and just watch what I do to your enemies. So God invited them to come and watch a battle, to just be the spectators rather than the participants in this battle that is to be fought. And God said, you will not have to fight in this battle. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Well, this was an encouraging word for them. So much so that the king just fell on his face there in the dirt and began to just praise the Lord and worship God. And all of the people, all of the army, they also fell on their faces before the Lord, worshiping him. And the priests stood, and they were praising God with a loud voice. And, All right, God, you know, this is what we needed to hear. They went from a place of fear into a place of confidence, having received the word of God. They went from a place of being overwhelmed by their problem to a place of rejoicing in the greatness and in the power of the God that they served. The word of the Lord, what strength, what comfort that it brought to them even in the hour of distress and need. And what strength and comfort you can derive from God's word when things look like it's hope, when they, things look like they are hopeless and you don't know the way out, what a comfort God's Word can be. And so they headed out against the enemy. And this certainly had to be one of the most unusual battle scenes and armies marching to battle that has ever been known in the history of man. For instead of having the chariots and, and the uh, horsemen and all out in front of the army, they had a choir out there in front of the army. They appointed a choir to go out and to lead the army singing praises unto the Lord. calling to the army, Oh, praise the Lord, for he is good. And then the multitude of the army answering back, For his mercy endureth forever. Now, there have been many infantry groups that have marched to cadences. It helps break up a march if you sort of can sing a song. And you know, you, you've heard the cadences as they march, count off, one, two, three, four. You know, and it, it just sort of helps you to get along. So these guys had the cadences. The choir was out in front. And of course, 
praise the Lord is hallelujah. So they're saying, hallelujah. And the guys would say, you know, they'd answer back, uh, <laughs> for his mercy endureth forever. And they came down the valley from Jerusalem, past the shepherd's field in Bethlehem. Turning south, heading down towards that valley that goes between the Herodian and the little villages there, to Tekoa, which is south from the Herodian. And there now standing on the cliff, looking down over the Dead Sea area and seeing the three armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and uh, Edomites down there below them, standing there on the cliff now to see what God is going to do. And the Bible declares, And as they praised the Lord, the Lord put ambushments against their enemies. As they were praising God, God began to wipe out their enemies. So that by the time they got to the place of the cliff of Ziz to look over, they saw all these dead corpses lying there in the valley. As they were marching, praising God, praising the Lord for His goodness and that His mercy endures forever. As they were marching towards the battlefield, praising the Lord, the Lord moved in and began to wipe out. Actually, what happened is that there came sort of an inner feud between those of Mount Seir and the men of Ammon and Moabite. They started fighting each other, killing each other. And there was this huge battle going on between the three participating nations, wiping out each other so that by the time they arrived, they had wiped out each other. And it says that there were, they went down and just started taking the spoils, and it took them three days uh, to take the spoils, and they couldn't even carry it all themselves. So much spoil there was that remained from the battle. Herein is a beautiful lesson that we can learn. And that is the lesson of victory that we can know through praise. As we learn to praise the Lord, God will begin to work in our behalf. The Bible says that the Lord inhabits the praises of His people Israel. And as you praise God, it's marvelous, for the enemy is put to flight. You know, I'm certain that Satan cannot stand to hear God praised. And every time you begin to praise the Lord, the Bible says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. And as you begin to praise the Lord, He inhabits the praises of His people. And God comes in, His power, His presence, but the enemy is put to flight. And I have found that you can praise the Lord in all situations. Now, the Bible tells us that we are to rejoice in the Lord. It isn't impractical and unrealistic saying rejoice in your circumstances because I can't always rejoice in my circumstances. Sometimes they're lousy. They're miserable. But I can rejoice that the Lord can give me the victory over any circumstance that I may be in that the Lord can strengthen me to cope with any circumstance. Though I do not praise the Lord for the circumstance itself, yet I can praise Him that I can have victory over the circumstances by His strength and by His help. 
in my life. In everything, there is something for which I can give thanks unto God and to praise Him. Oh, that men would praise the Lord, the Scripture said, for his marvelous works and his goodness unto the children of men. Oh, that we would learn the value of praise. Oh, that we would praise God more. Oh, that we would learn to just praise the Lord, even in little things as well as great. Our grandkids were over this weekend, some of them, so we ran out of milk. So my grandson and I headed down to the store last evening to buy some milk. And as we left the store, I decided to get a local paper, and I went to the newsstand, and all of the local papers were gone, so I went to another one in front of Thrifty's, and they were gone there. So uh, I pulled across the street, and they were gone out of that uh, newsstand. So finally, as we were heading up uh, Santa Ana Avenue, there was a, I spotted the newsstand there near uh, Mikasa's, and so I said, I parked across the street, and I said, I'll run across and see if they have a paper here. And I ran across, and they had one, so I got it, and as I came back into the car, I threw it down, I said, well, they had one. And he said, well, what do you say, Grandpa? And I said, great, we've got the paper. He says, no, you should say, praise the Lord. <laughs> and I thought of the scripture out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. And I thought, how wonderful that my grandson can teach me to be conscious of God's goodness even in silly little things like finding a newspaper that I wanted. That I learned to praise the Lord for everything, the little things as well as the great. That the praises unto God might just become a very part of my being. For if I will praise the Lord, and if I will learn to praise the Lord, while they were praising, God put the ambushments against their enemies. By the time they got to the battlefield, it was all over. There was nothing but the spoils and the victory to take. And you'd find that if you'll just learn to praise the Lord, a lot of these battles that you're being, you've been afraid of and fearing and and just sort of, you know, almost in terror. If you'll just learn to praise the Lord, you'll find that these things will have a way of just dissolving before you. For God will begin to work in your behalf as you praise Him. Shall we pray? Lord, teach us, we pray. the value of being thankful and of praising you for not only what you have done, but for what you are, for your mercy, for your goodness, for your grace, for your love, for your strength. Lord, may our lives be filled with praise and thanksgiving. May we learn, O oh Lord, to sing and to make melody in our hearts unto the Lord continually. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand?
You may be like Jehoshaphat today, facing problems this week that are bigger than you, and you just don't know what to do about it. God wants to help if you'll give him the chance. If you'll just learn to turn it over to him and begin to just praise him and thank him for his help, you'll be amazed at what God will do for you. Now, don't wait until it's all over to praise the Lord. For even while they were praising the Lord, the Lord put the ambushments against their enemies. God bless you. Fill your heart and life with praise continually as you rejoice in the Lord and in his love and in his mercy and in his grace.